Hello to you, and welcome to The Reality Show once again. My name's Dudley Anderson. On The Reality Show, we talk to people from all walks of life who've discovered the reality of walking with Jesus. Changed lives, changed lives. As we hear these stories, by the grace of God, it touches our lives, and we get changed for the good, for good, by the reality of Jesus Christ. If uh, we say anything today that just strikes a chord in your heart, I'll give you an email address towards the end of the show and invite you to drop a note to us. Well, today we're going to be talking about a messed up life being changed into a message of hope. Aaron Jarvis is a smashing young man who preaches the gospel of Jesus, but it didn't start out like that. Aaron was in and out of trouble most of his youth and uh, eventually got hooked on drugs uh, and, and crime and uh, became part of a gang. And then, sadly, his young daughter passed away. This tipped him over the edge and he became addicted to drugs and suicidal. But then, by the grace of God, he found himself in a church one day and was impacted by the reality of the message of Christ. Aaron gave his life to Jesus and God changed his messed up life into a message of hope. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today on The Reality Show. Thanks for having me. Really good to have you indeed. What a great story. Tell us what happened to you. So growing up, um, obviously, as you've mentioned, I wasn't a Christian. I didn't know who Jesus was. I'd heard of um, Christianity. I'd heard of this Jesus because my parents were Christians. But it was nothing that I'd ever followed, nothing that I was interested in. And to be fair, I got myself involved in petty crime at an early age. I think I stole my first car when I was about 15. And then I got dabbling with a few drugs here and there started messing about um, with harder drugs, hanging about with the wrong crowd, with the older lads, seeing them selling drugs, looking at them and thinking, oh, that's something I want to do as I get older. And then I, I meet who is now my wife, Helen. Um, and I was about 18 at the time. And she knew what I was about. She knew what I was involved in, all those kind of things. And um, we still, we got together. We had our first child, Kyle, who's now 20. He's going to be turning 21 in May. And then the story of Megan, which is our second child. Um, you mentioned Megan earlier. She's the, the one that died, sadly, which becomes a huge part of my story. We have a third child as well that she always tells me off if I forget to mention her. So I must mention her, Lauren. She's 16. Um, but Megan, um, that's probably where where I look to in my testimony, where I look to in my story, because that was my darkest, deepest, um, most horrible moment in my life. And it was for a season that that took its toll on me. And yet at the same time, we see a psalm in the Bible, in um, Psalm chapter 40, where it says that God, he heard their cry and he pulled them out of a pit, out of the mud, out of the mire. And I always think about that now. When Megan died, um, she, she was going to be the one that changed my life. She was going to be the one that kept me out of the, the drugs, out of gangs, out of crime. She was going to be the one that changed my life. I remember my wife being pregnant and I said, um, when our daughter is born, I'm going to change the way that I live. I'm going to do things different. But sadly, Megan passed away and it happened early on in her life. She was fine. And then all of a sudden, her organs started to shut down. And that's when my, my darkest days really began. Mm, mm, mm. So how old was Megan when she passed away, Aaron? So she was a, a newborn baby. So she'd just been born. And I remember the anaesthetist say to me, you can hold your daughter in a moment. Oh. And um, as, as he said that, I saw somebody run into the room and they started to massage her chest and I couldn't hear her crying and I knew something was wrong. And to cut a long story short, they whipped her past me on this trolley. And um, I remember giving her a kiss and saying, Daddy loves you, princess. I won't let anything happen to you. And they, they whipped her down to the Pooley baby unit where she was put onto a life support machine. And she would stay there for the remainder of her short life. But I was outside and I was praying and I was saying, God, if you're real, don't take my daughter for all the bad things that I've done. I was convinced that I was being punished because of the things that I'd done wrong. 
And I got a phone call from the doctor pretty shortly after that prayer. I'd never prayed to God like this before, but I just, I just thought it's, it's worth a go. You know, hope, hopefully something will happen good. And I even said, God, if, if you do rescue her, I promise I'll follow you. I, I don't know what I'd do. Just, just help her. I, I didn't know what else to do. For the first time in my life, I wasn't in control. I wasn't in control. I was at the mercy of the doctors. I was at the mercy of God if he was real. At this stage, I didn't even know if he was real. And when the doctor phoned me, he said, Mr. Jarvis, you need to get down to the Pooley Baby Unit. And so I started running down, convinced that a miracle had taken place. And when I got there, I saw my wife and she was crying. And I realized quickly that they weren't tears of happiness. And they said, Mr. Jarvis, your daughter's heart rate was 140, but it's dropped all the way to 40. We need you to allow us to turn the life support off. And as I allowed them to do it, we watched as our daughter passed away. And I remember something that troubled me for so long and played a big part in my drug addiction, to be fair. It was this noise. And I said to the doctors like, What's wrong with the machine? Is the machine broke? And they said, no, that's your daughter's last gasps of air. She's trying to breathe on her own, but she can't. And that, that literally took me to drugs in one sense, because every time I closed my eyes, I would just hear that sound. And my darkest days began. Mm -hmm. That's really, really sad. And especially that you had to you know, give the permission to unplug the machines. I don't know what I would do in a situation like that, uh, Aaron. And so, um, do you, did you blame God for this at all at the stage? Yes, there was a chaplain man came in. My wife had to stay in hospital for a week. She'd had a cesarean, she had to stay in hospital. They, they would bring Megan in, they put Megan on ice. I don't know how long this was for. I thought it was for a couple of days, but it was probably just hours, if I'm honest, I, I don't know. But they would bring Megan in and she was really cold and my wife would warm her up. But she was already dead at this stage. She'd already passed away. And I remember the chaplain coming in, the hospital chaplain, and he said, can I pray with you guys? And I just looked at him and I went to the bottom of the bed, sat down by the window and I was just so angry. I didn't want nothing to do with him, but my wife, she was um, being a lot more respectful and she allowed him to pray. And I remember looking out the window and I said, God, if you're real, I will never, ever serve you. If you're real, I will never, ever serve you. And today I can't help but serve God. Famous last words, as they say. Wow, Aaron it was really tragic. Uh, and so when little Megan passed away, you said uh, you became hooked, you became addicted to drugs. Did you become suicidal at all at the stage? Yes, um, it started off where I would take the drugs. Like I always say nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want to be a drug addict. It kind of creeps up on you. But I didn't do drugs for a buzz. I, I didn't do it because it gave me a buzz. I did it because it took the pain away. I did it because it covered it doesn't it doesn't take the pain away it just covered but it felt like it took the pain away at the time i, I did it because i didn't want to go to sleep at night cocaine became my main drug and that would keep me up for nights at a time i would session for three and four days at a time with no sleep and so as my life was spiraling out of control i came to a place where i was getting more and more depressed i'd been on the drugs for a couple of years and I just no longer wanted to live. I didn't see my life in this world. It was, this, this life only gave me pain. That's what it, it felt. There was stuff that happened in my earlier years. And then I get to this stage in life and here I am. Um, the happiest time of my, my life has become the saddest. Daddy's little princess is no more. And I don't know how to, to move forward. And so I became suicidal. And I used to think about it all the time, how I'd take my life. Usually when I was on drugs, which was quite dangerous looking back now because you're not in your right mind and you're ready to do something at the drop of the hat, which you wouldn't have done um, if you would have been in your right mind. But anyone that's suicidal, 
they're, they're not in their right minds. I, I, I've got this, this kind of saying now where I always say to the congregations, you know, don't make permanent um, decisions or, or permanent things based on temporary situations. And for me, at that time, it didn't feel like it was temporary. It felt like this was how I was going to be for the rest of my life. And so I wanted to cut the pain. I wanted out. I wanted to jump off this world. And I thought if I killed myself, then I would go to be with my daughter. That was my thinking. That's what I believed. I thought, end my life and I'll be with Megan. Not thinking of the people that I'd leave behind. Not thinking of my son that was uh, two at the time. Or should I say he was actually four at the time. He was two when Megan was born. But not thinking of anybody else. It was just my pain, my hurt. All the time I would think about it. And each time I went to do something, it always fell through, whether it was just me trying to do a cry for help or, or God not allowing it to happen. At that time, I didn't know. I just thought I couldn't even do that properly. Mm -hmm. Of course, the reality of it is, in fact, that if you had passed away, sadly, you wouldn't be with your young daughter. The scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wages of that sin is death. And that's an eternal death if we don't acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus in our lives and come to the reality of uh, a real encounter with God, which I believe you did. Dreadful story. So your wife uh, during this time, did she have any relationship with God? How did she deal with it? Um, my wife has uh, her own testimony as well. and. Although I think she's only shared it once from the, the front of a, a church, um, I don't think she would mind me saying that she turned to alcohol. Alcohol was one of her biggest things that she turned to. We lived separate lives in the same house. Even though we'd been married, we, I couldn't talk about it. Uh, I think my wife would have liked to have talked about it, but I just I couldn't broach the subject. It's taken me many years. Um, I wouldn't say to get over the pain, I would just say to, to learn how to cope. And um, I turned to drugs, she turned to drink, she turned to other things and and that's how she handled it. It was a, a messy situation for us both and neither of us knew Jesus. My wife didn't know God. I was actually the one that led my wife to the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us on The Reality Show. If you've just clicked on in on the website, perhaps you've tuned on in on the channel, on the television where you are right now, thank you for joining us. You're watching The Reality Show with me, Dudley Anderson, today sharing it with a, a young man who has experienced the grace of God in his life, Aaron Jarvis. And we've just heard how Aaron was born into a Christian environment but had nothing to do with God got involved with drugs and gangs, but not too seriously. And then sadly, one day his lovely little newborn baby girl, Megan, passed away. This tipped Aaron over the edge and he soon became addicted to drugs, overdoing it, as it were, uh, and became suicidal in his life. He and his wife self-medicating to deal with the situation. Aaron, thank you so much for sharing that with us um, and, and finding out more about your life and experience. Just before we move on, just to, to stop there for a minute, a lot of people self-medicate when they suffer stress and overload or burnout or loss, as you have done. You know, they turn to drugs, alcohol, other forms of self-medication, so to speak. Um, what's your advice to anybody? I know we're going to bring the gospel into this, but if anybody's listening, watching up uh, today, and they find themselves in a similar situation, what's your word to them right now? Just stop, take a listen. What is your word to them? Well, uh now, the man that I am today, I will always turn to the one that can set you free. And so I, I always lean on that as my, my first port of call. I, I know one that can help. I know one that can pull you out of the pit, out of the mud, out of the mire. Um, when I'm talking to someone that's not a Christian, when they don't believe in God, they, they don't always want to listen to that side. And so in a practical sense, it's like, We've got to pull ourselves away from those self-medicated things, as you said, because it's only going to get worse. It only leads us into a deeper mess. And so, I, like I said earlier, don't make um, permanent-based decisions um, based on temporary situations. People say time is a great healer. Um, 
I'm not I'm not sure I 100% agree, but I understand the meaning behind it. And as time passes on, you learn how to, to move forward, you learn how to cope, and you realize that there's still a purpose for your life in this world. Amen, fantastic. The scripture says, call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved, obviously saved from eternal damnation and sin. <laughs> but also I believe saved in this life from situations that we face as you and your wife did. So um, this was going on in your life. You were suicidal, you were addicted to drugs. Then one day you discovered the reality of God's love. Tell us how that happened. Well, uh, I was actually on a drug deal at the time and um, I walked into a church. Um, still to this day, I, I don't know why I turned up at that church. I don't know why I went in as such. I remember being attracted by the music as I walked past. And that kind of music wasn't my style of music. It was a worship music going on. It was in a very middle class church in a, an area close to where I live. And as I walked past, um, I just saw they had these big glass windows, these big glass doors. And I just saw people smiling and I saw their hands in the air and it was like, they, they had hope in that room. They had something that I didn't have. I hadn't smiled, it felt like, for years. And they had something I, I wanted. And so I stepped in to find out what that was. At the same time, having this battle inside of me, as if God is real, then he allowed my daughter to die. That was my thinking. That was what I would say. If God is real, he could have saved my daughter, and he never and so I don't know if I want to go any further with this um, God stuff. And it began from there. Mm. So you walked into this church, you were enticed by the nice smiles and, and the happiness that you saw there. When you heard the gospel, how did it impact your life? They originally put me on something called an Alpha course. They wanted to send me to a farm to help me get off the drugs. But they put me on an alpha course, which was teaching you the very basics about who Jesus is and the Christian faith and why, what the Bible represents, what it means, all these kind of things. And I went to this course. It was over a 12 week period and it was about week two or week three that I realized every Tuesday when the alpha course was on, I didn't take drugs. Every other day I took my drugs as normal. But when it got to alpha course day, I never took my drugs. Originally, I only went for the food. They do a hot meal with it, and I went in to get the food. I wasn't going in to listen to the message, but I got there, and I gotta be honest, the people were just so nice. There was this old lady, and she became like a nan to me, and she just became that nan type figure. And so I just liked being around them. I don't know what it was. Something kept drawing me in, and then it was one Sunday evening. It was a Sunday evening. I'd now gone into a natural church service that I'd never sat through before. I used to go out halfway through. I'd listen to the music or the worship, as we call it. And then as soon as the guy at the front started to talk, I'd go outside and have a fag because I just didn't understand it. I felt it was quite boring, all that. And then bang, I was just sitting there and it was like, who created the heavens? Who, who created the mountains? Who created the moon? Who created the, the sky? It was creation that made me say, there's got to be a creator. Somebody must have created this. This carnival happened by a big bang. And so now I had to find out who this God was, who the creator was. Was it the God of the Bible or was it the, um, another God? Who, who did this? How did it happen? And as the simple gospel was preached, it was like a lightning bolt just went off on me and a light bulb in my head went off. And I remember going to the front of the church. I, I put, I had a weapon in my pocket at the time. I used to carry it everywhere. It was more to do with um, just being paranoid. And I, I placed my weapon down at the altar and I said to this man who was a curate, um, it was a Church of England church that I was in at the time. And I, I placed this weapon down and he, he shared the simple gospel in my own language and I gave my life to Jesus. And in my words, I said, I no longer want to serve the devil. I want to live for God now. Wow. And I kind of swapped gangs. I changed teams. Wow. I love that. Swapped gangs. And God turned your messed up life into a message of hope. 
Just a, a rather honest question, if I may. When this happened, when you gave your life to Jesus, did you still blame God for the loss of your daughter? Um, there's been moments where I've just kind of cried, why? Not, not understand, look, why, Lord? Why did I have to go through everything that I went through? Um, and it, it wasn't just the loss of my daughter. It, that spiraled into so many more things, but it all stemmed from there. And it was like, why? But ever since I gave my life to Jesus, I, I, never, I never blamed him once. I never looked at it like that. I've obviously got an, a greater understanding now of why bad things happen. At the time, I didn't understand, but all of a sudden, I just knew God was real, and I knew he was a good God, and I knew that he loved me, and he'd come and made his home in me, and so I just didn't have those feelings anymore. He, com he completely transformed me. For, for a Christian listening to the story, he will understand this next bit of, that I say. It was a road to Damascus moment. It was a, a big transformation moment where everything changed. It, it wasn't um, slowly like a road to Emmaus. It wasn't slowly, slowly it happened and then it went off. It was a transformation overnight when I realized that Jesus was real. My swearing stopped. I didn't say another swear word. It's just my tongue could no longer swear. I just couldn't have it come out my mouth. It was like this tongue won't praise God and curse men. It was a transformation overnight I've seen those happen in people's lives and I've seen it happen gradually as well. Both, um, I believe God works with both ways, but with me, it was a, a smack in the face and it was a transformation overnight. Mm. You know, that's just amazing. You know, we can't outwit God. We can't preempt God. After all, he's in our tomorrow, even as we speak today. He's there already. And he knew your, your lovely little daughter would pass away. And he knew the moment that you would say, come into my life, Lord Jesus. We can't phase God. And even though you blamed him, you may even have cursed God. The grace of God expounds. The grace of God endures. And grace is God's doing. And he did it for you, Aaron. He's done it for me when he sent Jesus to take our place upon the cross, to take our worries, our anxieties, and our fears, and our losses, upon the cross and he is a God of healing and what you've just experienced and what you've just uh, shared with us is dare I say miraculous how God mm -hmm. could change your life how you could change your outlook how he could change your mind I always say we can have a change of mind you can change your mind if we set our minds on things above and Christ as Lord and Savior what an amazing story Aaron Jarvis so uh, you're now serving the Lord just in the next minute or so tell us what you're doing Okay, I became a pastor six and a half years ago. I took on a small church of 25 people and um, it quickly started to grow. The people I used to sell drugs to, the people I did drugs with, they were now coming in, getting saved, getting baptized, um, having those mo the same moments that I had. My wife was the first person I led to the Lord and so we've done this together. And now we're 24 congregations in seven nations. And so it's just grown um, so quick, so big, um, in such a short space of time. And I, I can only say that it's, it's all because of him. It's all because Jesus still built his church today. Still changes a messed up life into a message of hope. What is that message of hope, Aaron Jarvis? It's the one that can set you free. It's the one that came for each and every one of us. You said it earlier, the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For each and every one of us, he came for us all and he can turn our lives around. He can put a new song in our mouth. He can put our feet on a new rock. He's the one that gives hope, but that hope, it, that's not a wishy-washy hope. That word hope in the Bible, it's a certainty, it's a reality. One day we will all stand before Jesus. One day we will all stand before God and it will be too late to choose then. We get to choose here and now on earth. Do we choose to follow or do we choose to reject? God is a good God and he gives us free will and so he's given us a choice. It's our choice. I chose Jesus and so I look forward to the day when I leave this earth, when my mission's complete, I'm ready to go home and there is a little girl in heaven waiting for me to throw my arms around. But before I put my arms around her, 
I will go to the feet of Jesus and say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You saved me and you set me free. You gave me a hope and a reason Amen. to live. Fantastic. Wonderful. And that's the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. If you've been listening, if you've been watching, listening online, watching to us, and you have some questions, and maybe this has just struck a chord in your heart. Maybe you're facing a similar situation where you're blaming God for something in your life. I'd love to chat with you. Do drop me an email if you can, dudley at surereality.net, my personal email address. I would love to hear from you or make contact with this television station. Thank you indeed. Aaron, it's been fantastic speaking with you. We pray God's richest blessings upon you as you continue to serve him, sharing the story of a messed up life changed into a message of hope. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Wonderful. Just to reiterate, if you have any questions, if you'd like to comment, if you'd like some prayer, drop me a personal email, dudley at surereality.net. The reality show is all about lives touched and changed by the reality of Jesus. And we've heard that story today as Aaron has shared his life touched and changed by the reality of finding Christ, the reality of God's love, God's grace, stepping into his circumstances, not only saving his life physically, but saving his life spiritually. And he can do the same for you. Well, it's wonderful to have been with you today and I really encourage you to join us again next time as we get together to chat with the life touched and changed by the reality of Jesus in the next The Reality Show. Thank you for joining us.